Uh, you have your own seat, you know, right. you know and, and I'll just say commuter in Lynn, 12 express trains blow by that station, and when the trains show up in Lynn, the cars are jammed. You get on a boat, you have your own, you can, you know, you have a cup of coffee, a glass of wine coming home, you can, uh, can use your laptop, and you have a safe uh, and, uh, and comfortable ride. Uh, and I'll just leave you with this antidote. My wife works in, in, in uh, South Boston, and so she's been listening for 18 or 20 years about ferry service. Has her own parking spot there, and for years, I won't be taking the ferry. I have my own parking spot. She started taking the ferry, realized, wow, this is way better. Harbors have many uses and many users. Industrial ports, power plants, oil terminals, commercial and residential real estate, parks, open space, and recreational boating facilities, to name a few. So the first issue I want us to address here is, what does Harbor All mean for you and your city and the people who live and work there? And I'm going to start alphabetically from the top with Mayor Driscoll. Salem, most people think of Salem because of its history its festivals, particularly at a certain time of year, uh, and its world-class museum, the Peabody Essex Museum, among other things. But it has a great harbor, too. I know because I've sailed there any number of times. From the water, it's really quite a majestic place. I once made the mistake, though, of sailing up there for a quiet weekend in October, not knowing it was Halloween weekend. So, um, A little less quiet, then. Sure. <clears throat> and I know that you've gone through a fairly robust citywide visioning process over the last couple of years. So I think my first question is, you know, did interest in the harbor emerge from that? And if so, uh, what will it mean going forward? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for having us uh, being part of this panel collectively with so many communities who are on the waterfront and really see our harbor. For Salem, our, we don't have highway access. Our harbor is our Route 128. It's our highway. It's our economic opportunity. And it has been since Salem really was founded. The great age of sail, first millionaire in America. Salem's prominence um, at the time certainly all derived from harbor and our shipping uh, industries that existed. That very museum you mentioned started by sea captains who needed a place to house the amazing things they brought back from around the world. And we're pleased that it's still there. I think um, for us through our both our Imagine Salem process and our harbor planning process, that strong connection to history for people who live, visit, or work in Salem came through. Uh, Salem Sound, beautiful harbor. How do we make sure we're gaining access to it? For so long, the harbor was the key part of our economy. And then during the normal turn of the industrialization, you saw uh, our community more or less turn our back on the harbor. It became where factories were and wasn't necessarily the type of waterfront that it is today. And I've been pleased over the last decade as we've seen things turn over, an old coal-fired power plant, now a much smaller, cleaner, leaner gas facility with 40 acres around it for redevelopment, opportunities to bring cruise ships, to have coal ships, now have cruise ships coming in, in a community that's tourism is a big part of our economy, and to recognize recreational opportunities. People come here, they want the coast. We're so incredibly fortunate to live in a coastal community and so connected to Boston and to be able to have water transportation that can bring you from Salem into Boston um, every single day, May through October, carrying 70,000 passengers, for us really opens up even more opportunities to celebrate that waterway, to get people out in Salem Sound, and to make the really vital connections. I think why I'm excited to be here and all the work that Boston Harbor now is doing is because it's connecting us as part of a water network, going out to the Harbor Islands, connecting to Lynn, bringing people to Boston, and Vice versa, we have a lot of folks coming out of Boston into Salem, and uh, using the waterfront to do that is really key and vital to our success. So, so thank you. We'll come back to the connection sure. piece in a little bit. We want to talk a little more about water transportation. So, uh, Mayor McGee, uh, Lynn, I believe, is undertaking a new waterfront planning effort um, uh, that I think the last one was maybe 10 or 11 years ago. Is that right? So. Can you give us a little feel for some of the issues and uh, what you see as the focus of that plan as you go forward? Yes, and I, again, I want to say, as Mayor Driscoll said, it's uh, great to be here uh, focusing on uh, waterfront. Uh, uh, it's, and to have a full room, uh, being here with two colleagues that understand that. And uh, uh, I think we need to continue to have these larger discussions because it's an untapped, completely untapped, in my opinion, resource uh, that we're starting to just take advantage of. and. Uh, uh, Mayor Driscoll talked about it a little bit. Similarly with Lynn, and, and Doug Foy is here, who uh, I think we walked the waterfront about 12 years ago, 13 years ago, and was able to help us come up with the money for our first waterfront uh, master plan, uh, which uh, now is a little bit dated. 
So we're in the process of, of making that happen right now. Uh, we're also in the process of doing an, a waterfront open space plan in conjunction with that. So recognizing that there's opportunities there. And Lynn, similarly, I don't know that we, we had a lot of, uh, you know, probably 100 years ago uh, or so and, and probably, you know, 50, 75 years ago, a lot of barges coming in. We didn't have the same kind of um, harbor as Boston or Salem did, but we, uh, we took advantage of that and then we basically completely blocked off the harbor from our community and if you get behind the buildings if you ri drive on the Linway most people I bet 90 percent of the people in Lynn have no idea what's you know 250 300 yards behind all of the buildings that sit along our Linway uh, you go back there and you see the the amazing location we sit at looking out at the harbor island so I think people in the community are looking for to to again access that beautiful space uh, get a boardwalk from the General Edwards Bridge to the beach uh, see some development and op uh, opportunity for development, but uh, I, I see it as uh, you know there's mixed use opportunities with restaurant shops, boardwalk, public space, key, uh, but also we have a piece in the middle that's a working waterfront, which I think just is just as important, so that you can continue to create jobs that are port related, but uh, you know make that piece uh, I think is an important part of that. So it's not just from the bridge to the to the beach. We're building mixed use and housing. We're taking advantage of opportunities to create jobs that are linked to our waterfront as well. So. Uh, the community is really excited, and, and the water transportation, I, I know we're going to talk about, uh, a lot of people in our community were really excited when we had a chance to uh, get that off the ground. And many people who didn't, uh, who w would, or w didn't or wouldn't really use water transportation were really excited because I think th they realized this was an opportunity to focus on what we have here, a, a resource that we hadn't taken advantage of for 50 or 75 years. And so there really is an excitement about what we can do to upgrade, take advantage of, and really make a, a place where people in our community can, can come, enjoy, and, and, and be connected to the region by water. So providing more access to the waterfront and connecting the center of town and other parts of it with the waterfront sounds like a big priority Absolutely. going forward. And you have one designated port, I believe, right? And what, what are the, what's the use there now? Well, it's, uh, there's some use. There's not as much use as we'd like to see there, but that's where, where we're talking about in terms of the uh, working waterfront. We ha you know, there's some things that are happening there that people aren't aware of. There's a facility, this really nondescript building, and I had, was unaware of it until several years ago. It's about 40,000, 50,000 live lobsters in there that are shipped around the world. They, they take lobsters in. So that's happening right on, on our waterfront. Things like that are happening, but it's not really, uh, I think, uh, something that people are aware of. Uh, so we're looking to build on that, and uh, whether it be uh, boat-related or uh, business-related to the port, we, we do want to take advantage of that. Great. So you have other lobsters? We do. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like some? Absolutely. <laughs> And, and I should say, if any of you feel free to chime in and ask questions or, or help each other answer questions, that'd be fine. So, Mayor Walsh, I think you've probably set the world record for the most planning by any city in the United States in the last three years, which was Thank you. massively, <laughs> that was a compliment, because as we all know, I think it was massively overdue. So thank you for that. But um, imagine Boston 2030 was the lead, uh, identified lots of opportunities for open space around Boston Harbor. Um, Climate Ready Boston, which I'm very familiar with and have worked closely with you, uh, with your team in the city, also prioritized and is in process of prioritizing in different neighborhoods around the city, uh, various places where open space uh, can be used as a buffer to make the city more resilient against sea level rise and storms. Uh, right out here, we have a new municipal harbor plan, which is called for more open space, the Blue Way concept, right here around the aquarium. So. With all that planning that's been done and all these ideas for how to transform the landscape of the waterfront around Boston Harbor, how do you as a mayor prioritize what we do going forward? How do we get to execution over the next decade, say? Thank you, Bud. Uh, let me first of all just real quickly thank Eric and the Aquarium for hosting us today. Kathy, thank you for your great advocacy as well. I want to thank you, Bud. Austin Blackman, my chief environment, uh, uh, environmental affairs is here. Uh, and I also want to give a shout out to the Bar Foundation, who's been very supportive in funding so many di different issues around climate resiliency and climate change. So I want to thank them. Um, one of the things th that I think that we all um, will acknowledge as the night goes on is that, at least in Boston, I think there's been a missed opportunity over the last 20 years. Uh, you know, one of my first trips as mayor was down to. Brooklyn to see industry city and I, I saw the way that they really kept the openness to the access to the harbor and they were able to move the development back and, and we lost that opportunity in a lot of ways we, we're trying to patch it together now so I, I think that in looking back on time 
uh, I think a, a better plan would have been important. And I think a lot of cities and towns around America and around the world are looking and seeing what we did here in Boston and say, okay, we've got to do a little different. So in saying that, um, as we move forward here, it really is thinking about um, the development that we have, making sure that it, it's smart development, making sure that it's resilient development. Uh, we saw in, in January and March of this year, I think it was nine extraordinary high tides where we had uh, water coming into South Boston, into North End, into Charlestown, into all over the place. If I don't mention you, you know they came there. And, and, and I, I really think that we have to, as we think about development, I think it's two things. One is we have to think about when we, when we plan a building and we build a building, how do we create more open space there? How do we make sure there's green space around the building? And how do we protect the other assets that are in that area? Uh, and we're working on a, uh, on a plan right now, we've been working on it for a while through Climate Ready Boston, of really looking at the inner harbor. Uh, of Boston, and, and you know, we we don't have the luxury of having a uh, hundred um, yards of open space in front of all of our buildings on the harbor. So we have to think about: is it a seawall? Uh, is it a buffer? Is it uh, you know gates out in the Boston Harbor? UMass is working on a study now that's going to come back in a little bit and talk about that as far as, as far as possible barriers. So as we as we build and develop, we really have to make part of a lot of these developments uh, a portion of that as as resiliency and that word is a broad open word for a lot of different meanings on how we do it and I think that you know again to go back to the Brooklyn Yard situation loved it when we drove when we went we were on the we were on the Hudson and we drove on the outside and we went in as well uh, there was really a lot to learn from that um, I had a meeting with some of the designers of, of Brooklyn Bridge Park and they came into my office and they were talking about resiliency and they were literally talking about potentially building islands in the harbor to protect off of the off of the shoreline, so t similar for what Tommy's doing and what we're trying to do in Boston is a better harbor walk. How do, how can we create something that can be a barrier to sea level rise, open space for people to go on, while not disrupting the development that's here now, but the new development we have to be smarter with it. It's a very complex challenge going forward, but I, I think you're getting a good handle on it. And you know, we've been involved with a lot of the resilience planning that's going on in the seaport and elsewhere. And, and I think you're, you're exactly right. The one thing we heard from people over and over again, yes, we want protection, but we don't want to lose our sight lines and we don't want to lose our connection yeah. to the harbor. And there's been a lot of discussion. Yeah. And thank you to a lot of people in this room have, who have yeah. had a lot of discussions over the last 10 years. But now the time for discussion is over. It's a time for action. And we have to have a plan. I had Mary Robinson in my office this afternoon, the former president of Ireland, who, who has taken our foundation and really working on resiliency. And she was talking about the lack of lack of involvement in the, United, in the United States on resiliency, and that cities really have to step up more. And I think that what she said was absolutely right. We were doing it before, but I think her words are even more true today. And I can't, you know, I, I can't come to the aquarium anymore and give a conversation about the plans we're working on because people are like, enough with the plans. What is what, what's the concrete uh, actions that are being taken? It's it's the next step now to go into actions. I you know I, I can give more speeches about what we're doing, but people want results. I think part of that is we had we had a ver you know a number of big wake up calls with these storms this past winter, um, and they they actually weren't really more severe than storms in the past, but because we had five inches of more sea level since 1978, which was the big storm on record, they exposed as much uh, much of the same land and people to risk. So that, that's that our problem. In yeah. January, six yeah. more inches of rain. Uh, Right. Four inches of, of sea level rise. Uh, we're evacuating buildings, and I was talking to Commissioner Finn throughout that whole time. And what he was concerned about in the north end, a lot of people's utilities are in the basement. And if if that water came in six more inches, or it was six inches higher, we were evacuating buildings. We're evacuating homes. Um, it didn't happen. We didn't have a, a nor'easter per se when that happened either, which is another blessing in some ways. And I think that you know, for me, I mean, I've had a few wake up calls, but for me, that was something that really hit me because, and I talked to Austin a lot about it that we, we really have to start thinking about what are we going to do here because, um, you know, that storm's going to come. Um, it's inevitable, um, and it could come under my tenure or it might come under the next person's tenure, but whenever we have to do that, we have to start designing and doing construction now and development now to, to prevent that. Mm -hmm. Well, let's stay on the subject and go a little bit north to Lynn. Um, I know that uh, the city of Lynn did a vulnerability assessment on precisely this issue, I think, in 2016. Um, what did we learn from that in Lynn, and you know, how do you plan, and how does your city plan to address this big question going forward? Well, I still, I think we're still trying to get our hands around it. Um, mm -hmm. We we were impacted. Uh, it's funny if you look at Lynn, we have a um, substantial waterfront along Lynn Shore Drive, 
not impacted really. We've got a subs- it's, it's very high, mm-hmm. and w- were some really crazy uh, waves coming through during those storms. But that was not really the impact. The impact was uh, up up a little bit where the water was just coming right through into uh, lower areas down by the beach. And then we have this area uh, in the Westland, an area that is. Um, uh, you know, and there's this this ongoing issue with the people that live there, but it was uh, like a river coming in during those storms. Uh, you know, the, the, the Saugus River, because of the rise, was was very gradual, but as it came up, it wasn't uh, no waves, just the, the water came way in. So that's really one of the areas we're looking at, and we're working with MAPC to try and, uh, uh, try and get some, um, get involved with that, get some grant money, and really put some pieces in place in the community. We're struggling financially right now, so we don't have a lot of the um, city officials that can help us address this mm-hmm. particularly. Uh, we don't have a planning department. We have a lot of issues that we're facing financially. So we're looking to, to help outside help to get us uh, get our hands around it, talk about the resiliency, looking at our waterfront development. It's key that we understand that uh, on the, on the, off of the Linway. But really, some of the neighborhoods that are impacted, um, it, it, again, reflects, I think, what's happening in Boston. They were evacuated. The, the, the cellars were uh, flooded, and it, and it was uh, just the, the river rise during those storms. So. Uh, it's um, we we know where some of the areas are. We really need to put some pieces in place uh, in the city to start to address some of that. And again, looking for people outside the city to work with us as we uh, we try and put the pieces in place. Thank you. But as ta- as the manager said, I think one of the things you can do as well is as you're planning out the future of your city, uh, we're going we're about to begin a master planning process at Moakley Park in South Boston, and inevitably that'll have to be raised. We're doing parks in the north end; they'll have to be raised um, probably about 40 inches. Uh, we're looking at raising Main Street in Charlestown. We're looking at putting deploy the, the um, portable walls, if you will, uh, deployable walls in East Boston. So I think even if we don't have the money, and a lot of us don't have the money because we have a limit on how much you can spend, but as you start to prepare for the future of those parks that are around the seaport area, seaport areas of the city, you start to design them so that you know when the time comes, you, you're not doing a design now of what the park should look like today. You're actually designing what the park should look like 25 years from today, and how do you do that? And I think that that's a key for us in the city as we start to look at some of these these assets that we have in and around the harbor. Uh, Moakley Park is probably one of the best examples we have. And, and over Langone in the North End, that literally raising it two feet, we're not interrupting communities. We're not interrupting housing. We're not interrupting any of that. But once we build it, it'll be there to, to preserve. Excellent. So, and maybe we'll come back to that. Mayor Driscoll, you're nicely protected on the south by Marblehead, um, <laughs> and your harbor, you know, is is a little bit more cozy than you know where Lynn is certainly more exposed. But uh, you you have some issues, I know, in some we parts do. of town. We do. I mean, we certainly saw the effects of uh, the recent storms this year. Same issues: water flooding, and it's tidal, so you can't stop it. It's really waiting for it to get over and participating in the cleanup. We're still cleaning up. Beaches, erosion all around. You know, we've been working with CZM to try and look at innovative ways. We've done a lot of planning. We've got our climate change vulnerability assessment and adaption plan. It is time for doing. It's just so overwhelming, whether you're a large city like Boston or a city our size like Salem, where do you really start? And I've you know, we, we've described it as like eating an elephant, right, one bite at a time and um, trying to figure out where you find those those pinch points, where those opportunities are. We've partnered with CZM, looking at some innovations like a living shoreline, really creating another habitat uh, within a particular area of our beach and hoping that will grow and be something that can escalate in other areas. But I think even the greater challenges in the public side and the resources and trying to expedite permitting um, is also the private sector where we have development occurring. We need housing. We want it to happen. It's perhaps close to a train station. It's exactly the sort of um, smart growth you want to see, yet you also want to plan for sea level rise and making sure as we're approving these permitting projects and permitting these projects, we're taking that into consideration working with the private sector to ensure that long term we're not going to see another redo of water you know flying into somebody's front door Mm -hmm. Um, and that's challenging you want it to happen it's trying to get the permitting expedited the resources to do it and to work with the private sector at the same time I'm I'm guessing in terms of financing we're not going to get a lot of help from the federal government over the next few years one for political reasons but secondly most federal money flows post disasters and unlike a lot of the rest other parts of the country we're trying to get ahead of the game here by planning in advance which is obviously the very right thing to do what about the state you know how, what, what sort of help is needed from the commonwealth and have you all discussed this resilience issue with governor baker and what sort of response do you get 
I know during the last storm, uh, the governor and I were on the phone kibitzing about the challenges that we have. He was checking in, to be honest, and how's the community doing? He's on the North Shore, so he knows some of the areas that we were struggling with. And the, the two areas that we really talked about were resources. I think we've seen enhanced resources in this latest environmental bond bill um, for building um, seawalls back up, restructuring seawalls. This last storm, we had a couple hundred thousand dollars in emergency repairs, let alone having to actually restructure and rebuild the number of public seawalls. That's just the, the public areas that we have. But the expedited permitting as well, we're looking at permitting that sometimes can run from two to three years, and some of that's because the staff folks aren't there, some of that's maybe because of the level and degree of permitting that's required. How do we expedite that in a way that can ensure these projects, when you finally line up the money and um, the staff capacity to do it, that they can actually move quickly and get done? You know, I, I think I think number one is education as well of our different delegations. Uh, we have to let them know the importance of, of, of putting money in for preventative care, if you will, uh, and, and how much that can save us on the backside. I think that's that's key. Um, we're part of the Metro Mayors Coalition, and also all the mayors in the Greater Boston area get together often. And the last the last meeting we had, we really had a about an hour long conversation about engaging the state a lot more collectively as a group of mayors, and really thinking about how can we work with the state. And also, you don't write off the federal government. I know this government that's currently in place, uh, we probably aren't going to get the support we want, but it is important for us because the people that work in those offices are career. And it's important for them to understand as well what's happening in cities and towns around America, um, because I, I think it's you know when you look at the TV, um, you, you see you know you you see situate is always there and losing coastline and Cape Cod losing coastline. That's happening in Boston Harbor as well. So I think it's important for education. I think it's important for constant conversation. Um, the state is going to have to, going to have to step up and play in this space. If you look at the population shift of Massachusetts. The population is going from the central part of the state and the western part of the state to the eastern part of the state, and they're going to the harbor. And we're not alone in Boston. It's happening throughout the country. So I think when you see the population coming here, it's also about keeping people safe and keeping, keeping their homes protected, keeping industry protected, because we are the economic engines of the, of, of the, of the, of the north, northeastern part of the country. As Tom said, you know, talks, we, I joked about the lobsters, but think about the amount of businesses that, 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 are, that are supplied by what happens in land that people don't even realize. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I just, I'd just like sure. to follow up. I think that the biggest challenge is, is the recognition that we, the infrastructure investment we need to make is not happening across the board in, in, in every area. And it's a larger discussion uh, I, as elected leaders working with the state and the federal government, and I think just as importantly with, uh, with the people that we represent. And, and the the people that live in the in the region that understand that those investments not being made, uh, and I think one of the reports on transportation, the cost of uh, you know doing nothing. Uh, so it's it, that's a reality. And if we don't take a look at this and understand the ramifications of limited investment or, or lack of investment in these kind of issues, the price is is astronomical in, uh, in terms of our economy and how we can either grow or continue to see a positive uh, economic growth. So. It's it's a not an easy discussion to have, whether it be transportation or uh, infrastructure, uh, but the reality is clear and the facts are real, and and we need to continue to focus on uh, br building partnerships across the board with in, with government from the local level on up to get those dollars to where they need to be. Great, you know maybe it'd be helpful just population size and annual budget of each city. Uh, almost seven hundred thousand people, three point three billion. Seven hundred thousand and growing, or growing. Well, it's about six hundred and seventy-nine thousand. Good. In three point three billion, I like to round it off. Up. Census is coming. I'm going up with it. Good. Can you send me a quarter of a billion? <laughs> and Lynn? Uh, uh, Ninety-two thousand. The last census. We're probably over a hundred thousand people. With uh, looking at it right now, trying to get the budget down, about three hundred twenty million. Forty-four thousand people, one hundred sixty million. Great. So a nice range of. Uh, size and scale here. So I'd like to switch over to the connectivity issue, which is water transportation. And um, I think as anybody knows who's been around at least Boston Harbor for a while, there have been many fits and starts over the last several years of various ferry systems and different routes and uh, a lot of talk about new facilities getting built here and there and, and so on. But um, a lot hasn't uh, materialized in perhaps the way some people at least would have liked. Um, it's, a, it's an issue that I think has come back to the fore now, particularly as our highways get more and more congested um, and people are looking for alternatives. So and it's an issue that could really bring our cities together, particularly the three that are represented here today. And I know, Mayor Driscoll, that Salem has been very innovative on this issue for a good amount of time. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you've done and why and 
go from there. Sure. Um, so Salem has a ferry that goes in and out of Boston from May through October. We've carried about 70,000 passengers. Um, we actually own the boat, so we received a state grant approximately 12 years ago now that paid for 75% of the vessel. Prior to that, we had had a demonstration project to kind of tease out to see if this was something that would really work. We're only 14 miles north of Boston, but I don't have to tell anyone who lives on the North Shore, if you're going down Route 1 or going down Route 1A, it's not exactly the most joyous way to come in and out of town. And if anything, it's gotten worse, I think, over the last several years. It used to be bad just in commuting hours, and commuting hours feel like it's the entire day now. So the ferry is definitely one of the more popular ways to get in and out of town. Um, for us, really making it work was owning the boat. You know, ownership of the vessel, having that state investment was super helpful. Um, we just actually received federal funding for a second ferry, so we're really excited about thinking about having one boat's a ferry, having two boats become a little bit more of a network. How do we use that to go into the Seaport District where a lot of residents work from the North Shore? How do we use that to think about going to P-Town? It's about 90 minutes from Salem to P-Town. Like, think about driving that for a minute, right? Crazy. So um, for us, I look at the harbor always as our economic opportunity. Um, that ferry is Route 1B, right? 1, 1A, 1B wide open, so much space, so much capacity. Uh, comes into Long Wharf now. Again, we'd love to find some other areas in the seaport, especially with a second boat. Um, the ability to have the commuters who use our ferry have it be interchangeable with the T-Pass, so anyone who has a Zone 3 pass has the option of taking the ferry or the commuter rail. Salem has one of the highest riderships in the entire commuter rail system, so we have a lot of people who take, uh, who take the train in and out of Salem on a regular basis. Now they can interchange between the boat um, and the train. A lot of happy people, by the way, coming into Salem, going home, starting early with a cocktail. Everyone's a lot happier commuting on the boat than on the train. Um, Operating costs are significant, and we are, we're really fortunate that we have tourism. The, the commuter side of the house does not pay the bills, so to speak. Uh, we have a terrific operator in Boston Harbor Cruises, so having that mix for us of tourism, the tourists pay more money than the average commuter to commute in and out, um, has made the model successfully from a financial perspective for us, and having a really high quality operator. We've only got one boat, so if it goes down, we need to have somebody who has the capacity to bring in another boat, be able to service um, the range of uses that we have because a commuter use is definitely different than someone who's coming out for a day trip and Boston Harbor Cruises has been fantastic and great to work with so we're thrilled about expanding it on top of that we do have a water transportation a water taxi service that operates um, this year it'll be more of an on-demand service like an uber service and we'll also go out to uh, Marblehead so it won't just be intra Salem if you're in Marblehead another way to get in um, and cutting down on that car congestion that's you know getting folks out in the water enjoying the harbor absolutely but also keeping cars off of our roads. That's our number one challenge for new development, new housing coming in, uh, needs that we have. It's really just, it takes so long as a small city, only eight square miles to go from point A to point B, and water transportation could be a piece of that puzzle to help relieve some of that congestion. So uh, I'm really fascinated. In my first year here, one of the smartest things we decided to do was sell our whale watch boat. So we got out of the business of owning a boat and outsourced it. Uh, and, and to Boston Harbor Cruises, who have equ been equally good for us. And I think, Eric, at this point, sometimes in the summer, they do eight trips a day of whale watching. So it's you know become highly successful. But wh what was the biggest stumbling block or the biggest challenge to get to where you are in terms of your now will soon be t you know a fleet of two boats and making it work? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're relying just on commuters, it's hard without an operating subsidy. We'd, the stumbling block for us is definitely having the flexibility. Having more boats will provide more flexibility. We go in, we come back. We go in, we come back. Being able to have that network. Um, owning the boat, although you wouldn't want to necessarily own the boat the way we have our contract fashioned, um, the state picked up a large piece of it. Um, the operator takes in all the revenues but is also responsible for the maintenance. There's an hourly fee charged off for the capital. And we've got a high-quality operator. They know how to run the boat. It's a high-speed catamaran. Uh, they know how to operate it. They know how to fix it and repair it. Uh, they do well in the off-season in terms of making upgrades, and that has really made it work. But if we didn't have that subsidy to purchase that boat, it would never have worked with us actually putting out the outlay of capital. Um, it, it, we, we would have to have severely subsidized it. We'd love more interaction with the T. I think it, this is the first few years that we've been able to have the interchangeable uh, T pass, and that's been a big help because the train service is very, very good in and out of Salem, and people can now combine that with the flexibility you need if you're a commuter or somebody traveling mm -hmm. in and out of Boston. So, Mayor McGee, you were a really strong advocate for mass transit and water transportation when you, when you were the chair of the Transportation Committee in the, in the legislature. Um, I believe at the moment Lynn does not have ferry service running, and where do you think you're going with that, and what do you hope to do? Uh, 
Well, it's um, anybody that's in this room knows me probably knows I talk about water transportation once in a while. Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, you know, about 18 years ago, and we've been talking about the Blue Line to Lynn since 1946 or before, uh, still not happening. So, uh, uh, you know, I was in the legislature and it actually was on a ferry from New London to the Vineyard, and the light went on when I got on that. It was like two, two and a, two, two and a half hours maybe, for, which would have been a six or seven hour journey. And, I, and, it, and it hit me, you know, you know we're, we're 30 minutes from Boston by boat. And so for 18 years, I've been beating the drum on before I was on the Transportation Committee, beating the drum on what I think is, is uh, a, an un, unlimited, unlimited for everybody in this region, water transportation, whether it be San Francisco, New York, uh, Baltimore, they've taken advantage of it. We have not taken advantage of it. And the idea that, that uh, cities have to be buy a boat and run the service and we're running it, first of all, there's no way in hell that Lynn's going to be buying, a, uh, buying on our own boat and running the service. Uh, so uh, I, I have been pushing hard. We got a, a four and a half million dollar uh, in uh, Grant a couple of years ago. We're still trying to f get that over the finish line to get our own boat. But I think it really is in, in uh, uh, the larger opportunity is what we need to be looking at and, and partnering uh, with, uh, you know, Salem. Uh, Twelve years ago, nobody believed it was going to work, Kim, right? Nobody, everyone said, you're absolutely crazy. You don't spend any of the city's money. Nobody's going to come on a ferry. Uh, we had the same we had the same thing. We got the second phase of funding for our $7.5 million state-of-the-art facility in Lynn. And the Lynn paper wrote, a full-page editorial, Tom McGee's crazy. Nobody's ever going to take a ferry from Lynn. My own paper, we're getting a half million and a half dollars to continue the, to get that ferry going. Mm -hmm. uh, 4,000 people a day take the commuter rail uh, down to the North Station from the North Shore that work in the Seaport District, South Boston Waterfront. Uh, they could be on a 25-minute boat ride from Lynn to Boston. If you took a quarter of those or a half of those riders, you'd be running the Hingham Ferry service out of Lynn, which is the best bang for your buck of any uh, service. It's 65 cents on the dollar, and I read a story recently in the address section of the Globe, 85 cents on the dollar return. So the idea that the subsidies are crazy, that this can't work, we could buy 15 or 16 ferries for $100 million. If we had the locations to get those ferries running, we started running 15 or 20 ferries in the region, guess what? We would have riders, and we would have economic opportunity popping up all throughout this region, in Quincy, in Winthrop, in Salem, in Lynn, in Beverly, in Marblehead. Uh, and Boston, I, I don't have to explain to Mayor Walsh, uh, uh, he understands because the, the gridlock that's happening, there's so many opportunities to access what's going on in Boston by the water. So uh, it's about Lynn, it's about trying to get us year-round service because I think it will be uh, successful for the, for the first year. We had 13,000 riders, second year 15,000 from May to September. That was close to 300 people a day uh, with not a lot of uh, money. Not a lot of advertising, limited commuter rail pass access, two rides in the morning, two rides at night. It's a no-brainer in my opinion. So um, I feel very strongly about it. Hingham, Hull, Quincy, Plymouth, down to the Cape, 90 minutes to Provincetown. We have an opportunity here uh, to take advantage of what we have is the greatest resource we have and to make something really great happen. And it's, it can't be city to city. It needs to be a robust a coordinated system that recognizes this. I, again, Logan Airport has a state-of-the-art facility there. Uh, nobody's, uh, nobody's going over to Logan. I know there's access points from the, from the ferry location to in, inside the terminal, but that can be figured out. So, as you can tell, I'm pretty passionate about it. Uh, <laughs> but, but we need to make it happen. Yeah. Can I just add one sure. comment to that? And 100% agree with everything that Tom has said, the amazing opportunities that we have on the harbor. The other key piece is once you buy the boat and invest in the port and you get it operating, there's no track maintenance, there's no potholes, there's just no, all the money we spend on maintenance right now for the other traditional ways of um, commuting and having uh, cars and vehicles and trains and buses come in, to, come in and out of Boston, they don't exist. That, those dollars that you're spending to help subsidize the purchase and the operation, you're not spending them on a lot of maintenance. And it's, from a financial perspective, if you look at it in that capacity, it makes it even more of a no-brainer than the comments that Tom ever made. Already well, made. what I'd like to follow up, because you've got a really good point, Kim, is uh, none of that's factored into the decisions, that there's no maintenance, that the maintenance is very limited. You know, it's less than 50 cents on the dollar we get return on commuter rail, which is a 19th century system. That's another story for another day. Uh, <laughs> The, 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 you're right. The, the, uh, the, the maintenance is, is very limited. And so you can, you know, when they really look at the real dollars and you've got the Pioneer Institute uh, saying, saying we should spend money, uh, they don't usually do that, on water transportation, you, they know, they understand that if you look at all of the dollars and all the costs, 
the reality is that water transportation in this region is the best bang for your buck. Thank you. Mayor Walsh, do you want to comment on this? I, I think there's a new route opening up soon from North Station to the yeah. seaport. Is that well, right? I th yeah. I'm not sure yeah. if I can add to these two. No, I mean, they're no. pretty no, great. We're, we're going to put him on the road. There's but, no but, question. But you brought up a point earlier about what can we do with the state and the environmental bond bill that's going through its way through the legislature now. I think there has to be a conversation around transportation slash environmental bond bill. Uh, I think that, you know, as we think, we're here talking about the harbor, obviously, and, but we're also talking about indirectly the environment and, and all of the cars on the highway that are out there. And if we can figure a better way of, of, of transportation, uh, whether it's bikes or boats um, or, or public transportation, I think that coming up with a system that works for all. Um, Kim brought up the Uber idea on, 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 the, on the boats. I'm not too, f I don't know how I am in the Uber situation in cars. They just stop or wherever. But I'll tell you, I was at Del Frisco's one night having dinner, and I sat outside, and I was watching this boat. Uh, just a, it was just a small taxi shuttle, and I, I watched some, the, the gentleman uh, in the boat. He must have made 15 trips across the harbor, and every time he went across, it was full, and every time he came back, it was full. And I believe he was going over to East Boston and Charlestown, and it was a wonderful way for transportation in the inner harbor. And, and I do think that it is important that people, we have a, a reliable service. I also think, and Tom touched upon this briefly, um, he talked about his trips going up in Lynn without marketing. We have to market as well. Mm -hmm. It has to be a reliable service. I think one of the, one of the shortfalls of the, of the late night tea service that was happening here in Boston, it wasn't marketed. People didn't know. Even though we all think everyone pays attention to what we say, um, it, it's about marketing as well. And I think that investment and marketing and letting people know that it's a reliable transportation op option uh, is something we have to do. Yeah. The other key piece that I find interesting is, you know, Boston, in comparison to New York in terms of city size, New York's plunking $300 million into ferry service to get to places that, frankly, if we did an overlay of New York or Chicago over Boston, like, we'd be a borough, right? Lynn and Salem would be boroughs of Boston. People need to get in and out really easily, and we need to look at water transportation as a real alternative to do that. And every other part of the country sees the waterfront as an asset for transportation, whether that's for economics, whether that's for quality of life, um, except us. And it's completely underutilized in every single venue. I think one piece is it's commuter, commuter service or commuter rail. It's transportation. So I think the, this monomer is, I'm not going to take the commuter rail because I'm, you know, no, it should be transportation options, and how often are those options available? The same with water transportation. It's not commuter service. It's transportation service to the region. And I think th th that seems like a simple discussion, but in many ways it changes the perception of what we're talking about here and uh, in a real way. And, and, and just an example of what you're just saying, Kim, uh, you know, if you lived in New York and you lived on Manhattan, uh, Lynn is Brooklyn. So we are really connected in a way that more than we realize. Are we Long Island? Where would no, we be? No, you're, 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 yeah. you're on the edge of Brooklyn. Okay. You're Montauk. Right. Right. <laughs> you're close to Brooklyn. You're all part of Brooklyn. All right. I'm Brooklyn, too. All right. You know, I think there's probably a, an additional case to be made. Boston has pledged to be carbon-free or carbon-neutral by 2050. Our state has pledged to be 80% uh, reductions. It's pretty clear, I would think, although I haven't studied it, that traveling by boat, particularly if you get 50, 100, 200 or 300 people on a boat, is going to be a lot less carbon emissions than everybody in a single passenger automobile. And that's what I meant by that. I mean, yeah. it's also, we're also do, being healthy to the environment and, and doing what we're supposed to do. Good. We need all the housing we can get. I mean, our, most of the folks coming into Salem right now are coming out of Boston and Cambridge and Somerville because they can't afford your prices, and then they're forcing the folks who live in Salem to go further up as well. But we're not going to build new roads to get out of getting people in and out of town. It's going to take some kind of alternative. And there's no place to build the roads. I mean, that's right. one of the problems we have in Boston when we think about expanding and, and doing bike lanes and different things like that. It's just We just have no space. No real estate uh, for and, it. And, 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 you know, and we, this third half of town, I mean, the Central Lottery Project was great, uh, but there's, we can't expand the highway. There's no place to go unless we dig another tunnel. Mm -hmm. And Mass Inc.'s report the last few weeks with uh, transit-oriented development you know, focuses on commuter rail for the 13 gateway cities. I think just as easily could have focused on, on the regional, uh, all the region uh, access points to the water. Similarly with, as you say, housing, job opportunity, and connections that really make, make sure that the economy is not going to stagnate over the next few years. We're going to continue to grow. So just a little plug for Boston Harbor now related to this topic. Uh, there's a study coming out on water transportation in Boston Harbor. And possible connections to these in other cities that will be out in 
June or July, there's a good answer. Okay, so keep an eye out for that. I, I think it'll enlighten us even further uh, on how to proceed and how to set priorities in this area, which, which will be great. So I wanna turn to one last question before we open it up to the public, and, and this is a complex question about gentrification. Um, you know, having run the aquarium here, and I looked back into the history, and this whole piece of land, this pier, was sold to the New England Aquarium in 1968 or 69 for $1. Uh, because at that point in time, the harbor was pretty decrepit and the waterfront was in bad shape and it was a way to stimulate development of the waterfront, which had, I think it really had a major impact over those years. One square foot of a new condo uh, over in the seaport now goes for $2,000. And this is a, you know, an interesting challenge, I think, going forward as we talk about you know, making the harbor more resilient and adding more open space. We have to balance that with uh, all the new development that's taking place. We need private development for our tax base and to pay for some of the things that we want to do. But there is a real risk that we may be walling off the harbor to lots of the people who could really benefit from getting there. So how do we tackle this issue in our harbors and along our waterfronts? How do we really make it a harbor open to all? You know, I think in Salem, in some ways, the, the opposite is occurring, and I'll give a couple of examples of that. This coal-fired power plant, the Salem Harbor plant, that has been on Salem's waterfront since 1950, also sits next to the South Essex Sewage District, which is around the corner from the former Pequot Mills. We have a waterfront that, frankly, has been tied up in many industrial uses. There are public access points. We've got a park service. We've got lots of waterfront parks, so I don't want to diminish where those public spaces are, but many of those really industrial use properties that had gates on them you never had access to at all are being transformed. So that 65 acre power plant site is now a 10 acre natural gas plant with lots of public access built in through the permitting process. 40 acres around it for redevelopment. It'll hold the cruise port. It's right next door to where the ferry comes in. So we see that as a blossoming of an opportunity for waterfront development. Uh, same thing with Shetland Park. Some of the permitting process now enables us to get into some of those as they're being redeveloped and reused to get into some of those areas to create public open space while also helping our economic needs. The power plant has been our largest taxpayer since 1950. Meaningful impact to us. We'll not only continue to see that revenue and deliver power to this particular of this NEMA market, which is in high demand, but also have a mixed use opportunities, maximize the commercial port that was there. To have a coal ship coming in in its heyday, maybe once a week it brought coal in. And to think about what it means to us now, not only cruise ships, visiting vessels, some bit of a working waterfront in terms of fishing expeditions and the like, water taxi service, it's way more valuable to us now. And it's not even fully tapped yet. Mm -hmm. So in some respects, we're not having um, the large scale development that's limiting some of our economic opportunities. We're seeing leather factories, old junkyards, power plants, turning themselves and blossoming them into what's next. And for us, that's mixed use. Um, we're not the Gold Coast. Salem was the place where I think it ended up with the, a, a poorer community at the time that ended up with uh, power plants and industrial uses and sewerage districts. And now we're starting to see that really opening up. Salem State's Cat Cove lo, la, um, Laboratory is there as well, and more public access. So I think it's something to be mindful of, the gentrification for sure. The waterfront played that prominent role in the characterization of Salem. You had sea captains' mansions around the corner from tenement houses where folks who worked on those docks live. So it's played that prominent role. We want to have that mix of people for sure, uh, but we also want to see those areas that were once gated and you know unable to be used for public access. Unobstructed views of Salem Harbor are now much more available. Mayor Walsh or Mayor McGee, you want to comment? Yeah, on this, this is um, <coughs> this is a complicated one because of of what I mentioned in the very beginning. Uh, much of the development that happened on the waterfront uh, was already built um, by the time um, I got here, and, and it was been built over the last 30 years. I remember working uh, in downtown and um, when Rose Wharf was built, which was a, a great building at the time. It was built right on the ocean. Uh, there's not a lot of space, so I think one of the areas we have to look at in the city is the Flint Industrial Park and how we plan that out for the future uh, to make sure that access to the waterfront stays there. Um, and if we can tie it into a, a larger resiliency um, conversation plan about sea, sea walls and, and open space along the inner harbor and how we do that, how that would end, end up being at some point, how does it all tie in? I, I think that that's what we have to do and, and tie it all in together. 
uh, the gentrification piece, um, you know, in the South Boston waterfront, it didn't exist 20 years ago. Um, these are m mostly new neighbors that came in here and lived here and paying $2,000 a square foot. I'm not sure if it's that high, but paying a lot of money for it. In some places it is. Mm -hmm. um, our gentrification concern is what's happening in the neighborhoods uh, as people start to get pushed off of the borders, like Kim said, in, in, in Salem being pushed out of Salem. Um, I'm concerned about people being pushed from you know, the South Boston residents into Dorchester and to Braintree and, and new people coming in and not being able to create opportunities for people to live. It's a whole separate conversation, but our housing plan is pretty aggressive uh, to create 53,000 units of new housing by the year 2030 uh, to allow the people that live in the city to stay in the city. Uh, and also regionally, um, this is a separate conversation, but regionally working with cities and towns in the greater Boston area, I think there are about 330,000 units of housing that needs to be built in the next 20 years to, to keep up with the growth. Uh, all of that can happen in Boston, uh, and we have to make sure it's mixed use. Great. Mayor McGee? Uh, we're, we're, a, we're in a little different place. I think both communities trying to get the open space. Uh, as, as Kim said, the, uh, uh, you know, the waterfront was all blocked off. We had our landfill on our waterfront, and really there's the 300 acres probably that are yeah, not really open yet. For op so part of it is creating that open space, and we're working on that, creating the public access. I think the bigger challenge as we start to look for development, which we need, and on the tax base and market rate, which we need, is is how do you make sure that there's uh, the, the housing issue is addressed in a way that all ma all levels of income can can share in the, in the growth and and the upgrade of our community, but just as importantly, know that they're not getting pu pushed out. And it really isn't just a Lynn issue, a Salem issue, or a Boston issue. It really is a regional issue. And so we need to, you know, as we look at the development of our waterfront and those opportunities, we need to understand how we can. Uh, create those access points for people in, of all levels of income to continue to live in the communities that they want to live in. And I, we have a six-lane road in, in the in Lynn, uh, the Linway that kind of blocks access to our waterfront. So as we see some of that development, I'd like to see that reimagined, maybe four lanes, and starting to access some of the lower-income neighborhoods that that are really just on the other side of that, and and continue to upgrade those neighborhoods, make it continue to make it affordable, but make sure that those locations have easy access down to our waterfront, some of the open space, and really the mixed use that I think is is the key to what we need to do on a waterfront, as well as uh, as I said before, a little bit of a working waterfront, commercial restaurants, shops, boardwalk, open space, living space, but that the whole community can share in. So it's a, it is a complex issue. Um, and it's it's how do you create the right development that brings value to the community that needs it, and how do you continue to value the everybody in your community that's that's trying to make it work uh, with with so many different levels of income. So it sounds like mixed use is a key, making sure there's access to the waterfront and open space, and going hell for bent to build as much housing as we can in this region in the next decade or two. Yeah, we're going to have to, and, and also planning. I mean, we're looking at the Northern Nab Bridge right now. Uh, rebuilding yeah. Northern that bridge and in, in that bridge it used to be a bridge to move people and cars across uh, we're really looking at opportunities to open to access to the water there too because uh, there's two sides of that bridge that could we could do something spectacular there that could allow access to the water so I think any place that we can get access to the water uh, and and eventually tie it all in I think that's key we've been talking about the Naponsa Trail for th 35 years here in, in the Boston area and, and if you know 35 years ago, you couldn't go from Castle Island to Canton. Today, you can pretty much go from Castle Island to Canton uninterrupted all the way. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you all. I'm going to open it up, and Mayor Walsh, you just let us know when you have to scoot. And uh, <clears throat> So now I'm not sure whether we had questions that have been gathered or we're just going to take them as hands go up. Looks like it's my choice. As hands go up. And, Han, and my question is for Mayor Walsh having to do with uh, traffic abatement. I rode here tonight on my electric motorcycle and therefore took a car off the road, reduced the parking demand. I suggest that there a lot could be done to reduce traffic load by making Boston more motorcycle friendly in terms of adapting parking spaces that are not usable for cars to make them specifically designated for motorcycles and therefore reduce the traffic demand on the roadways, at least in the summer months. Okay, I know from experience here that the moderator has to repeat the questions because it's hard to hear him down here. So I think if I got it right is how do we make, let's say, Boston, Lynn, and other places more friendly for motorcycles? That's a great point. I have no idea how many, how many spots we have for motorcycles. I see Chris Osgood behind. I don't know if you, if you know any, Chris. We don't, we don't have it across city. So your, your answer is absolutely something that we will look at. Chris Osgood is my chief of streets. He's sitting right behind you, and we will take that point back. Uh, Barry Bluestone, Northeastern University. I wonder, um, 
Mayor McGee, uh, if you could tell us about the prospects for year-round use of ferry service, um, given the environment, given winters. Um, is that really feasible? I hope it is. How does it look to you? Absolutely viable. Uh, we're about three or four or five minutes of open water once you get outside the harbor. Um, I think uh, you look at it in terms of what Hingham and Hull are doing, uh, I, I think absolutely it can happen. We had the, the, the son of the person who created the um, New York Waterways uh, water transportation system, and they run out the end of Manhattan. They run in pretty rough water, if you think about it. And I asked him point blank when he came to Lynn, can, can uh, we run a year-round service? I have always believed it, if you get the right vessels. And he said, no reason you can't be running year-round. So uh, I think there's more opportunity for year-round. Uh, I think, um, you know, Kim, they've, you've stretched it out a little bit uh, in the fall. Uh, in the spring, there's definitely times you can run it. So I think no question you could have year-round service. I really believe we could match the Hingham uh, service. Uh, if we uh, did it right with the right prices, with the right advertising, you would have that kind of uh, opportunity. And I, I, we haven't mentioned it, but 98% on time. The service is 98% on time. During, uh, during major snowstorms, if it's not a northeaster and the roads are completely clogged up, there's no plowing on the waterways unless the harbors freeze up. So uh, I absolutely year-round service from Lynn, and I think what the key would be, and, and I think, uh, Marty, you mentioned it, it's, uh, it's, it's knowing what the schedule is and knowing that you can depend on it. That's really important. I'm guessing it's an enclosed cabin with heat and a cup of coffee in the morning and an enclosed cabin with heat and a glass of wine in the afternoon, and you make it you, work, right? Yeah, you have your own seat, you know, right. you know and, and I'll just say commuter in Lynn. Twelve express trains blow by that station, and when the trains show up in Lynn, the cars are jammed. You get on a boat, you have your own, you can, you know, you have a cup of coffee, a glass of wine coming home. You can uh, can use your laptop, and you have a safe uh, and uh, and comfortable ride. Uh, and I'll just leave you with this antidote. My wife works in... in, in uh, South Boston, and so she's been listening for 18 or 20 years about ferry service. Has her own parking spot there, and for years, I won't be taking the ferry. I have my own parking spot. She started taking the ferry, realized, wow, this is way better. She was on, she was on the ferry service, uh, was it last year? or t Anyway, the year, but whatever it was, and uh, the ferry that, that day was unavailable for, so they brought in a much smaller ferry. It was a really rough day. She's texting me, I think, I hope I make it back. The chairs were flying around, and I said when I saw her later on, I said, how were the rest of the people on the boat? She said, nobody seemed phased at all by it. I was the only one that seemed concerned. <laughs> so to, the, the point's well taken. People know they can depend on it. They like the, uh, the options, and they really enjoy. Once you get on a boat, you will take a boat no matter what option is out there. Mayor Driscoll, do you want to comment? Yeah, I mean, I think um, for us to go all year would be a little bit more difficult. The size of the boat then start to drive down the economics to address some of the open water. But I can tell you the happiest day of the year for Salem commuters is when the ferry starts, and the saddest is October 31st when it ends. Um, they actually have a reunion in February to get ready for it. I mean, people are <laughs> fans of the boat. And if you've taken it in, you... You can't be in a bad mood when you get off the boat. It's just something about the waterfront um, and bringing you in. So when it's late, it's less of a problem. <laughs> um, and it's, it's just a terrific resource. But for us, it'd be a little bit more difficult, Barry. Yes, uh, my name is Paul Bowdish, and I have been a uh, very happy sailor in uh, Boston Harbor for uh, a couple of decades now. And I'm a U.S. Uh, Coast Guard licensed master captain, and I'm really serious about recreational boating. I wonder if you all could comment about the uh, opportunity for recreational boating as a driver of economic growth and what we might do to uh, make more opportunities for recreational boaters in and around the Boston Harbor Islands. I mean, we see a growth opportunity in Salem for sure, trying to provide additional dinghy docks, transient slips, um, I, opportunities to both market to uh, boaters, the boating community as Salem as a destination, whether it's for day or overnight trips. Um, I can't speak to the Boston Harbor Islands as much. I've been there. I think they're beautiful, and there's definitely some opportunities. But on our end, it ties in perfectly with the tourism and the shopping and the dining that we're trying to create in terms of a downtown activity. Uh, it definitely is an economic driver. I mean, with the restaurants we have in, in and around all of the cities and towns up and down the coast, uh, people are boating, stopping for lunch, enjoying the day. Uh, I would love to see. I know the Boston Harbor um, Group Committee would love to see more people using the Boston Harbor Islands, going and visiting and docking and going out there on uh, Spectacle Island. There's a shop out there, beautiful. Uh, you can go up to the top and see beautiful views of the city, and you can see beautiful views of Cohasset and Quincy and other places. So I, I think it, there's no question about it. I think the, the boaters know about it, but I think there's probably, there's probably an opportunity for people to come in from outside of 
visiting Boston. I'm not even sure whether to go to rent boats for the day, but I think there's an opportunity for people to go out and sail on Boston Harbor. Uh, obviously, it has an incredible rich history, uh, and it's a beautiful harbor. And I, same thing with Lynn. I think there's great opportunity. We look right out at the Boston Harbor Islands from, uh, from our waterfront. Uh, we do have several marinas, one city-owned, two that are privately owned, that, that are all, f all fill full. And I think there's just, uh, as we continue to enhance our harbor and, and, and take more opportunity, we're actually in the process of working with the Army Corps of Engineers to dredge from the gas tank, if anybody knows Lynn Harbor, out to the Saugus River, which will r even give more access once we do that, and, and we're, we're thinking it's going to happen, they will, in, they will maintain it in perpetuity. So we will really start to enhance our ability to be more of a harbor. And I think the, the um, uh, getting a chance to use uh, that kind of uh, you know, sailing and uh, uh, pleasure craft coming and going out of Lynn would be uh, absolutely an economic driver and, a, and an enhancement of what we have in our community. Can I yeah, just sure. add one thing? So mm -hmm. one thing for this season is um, we've connected the water shuttle service to try and make sure the safe anchorage areas that the Harbor Master has available for transient slips are there. That also connects to our bike share. We've got an RFP out for a floating restaurant that used to be used to be one many, many years ago, and we think that's an amenity that will be a natural attraction to the boat boating community. And another way to get residents who don't own a boat out as well and utilize that water shuttle. So I don't want to miss that, that key point. And, and one point I think that's a little off to this track, but... Uh, there's there's no, no real access points to the Boston Harbor Islands north of Boston, so Lynn and Salem and other places that, that I think there's a no-brainer. I mean, you, you, like I said, you can almost reach out and touch them from Lynn, and there's a lot of people in our community that aren't going to be traveling to the Cape or other way, other places, but for a day on the islands, it would be a, a, a great access uh, for someone to have a really enjoyable uh, day and, or, or throughout the summer. So that's also an opportunity. The pleasure boating is, is great, but I also think starting to have more service to make sure we take advantage of those beautiful islands is something that we, on the North Shore in particular, we could see, uh, I think, stepped up. And, and it hasn't gotten much attention, actually, but if you look what's happened in the marinas in Boston Harbor, if you look at Long Wharf, Commercial Wharf, Charlestown, and now Shipyard across the way in East Boston, they've all been upgraded uh, by the private sector with you know, fairly significant expenditures. Th that's and the, also. And the, and the sailing centers and the learning clubs for kids are booming, as far as I know. I think private <laughs> investment's key to everything we talked about tonight, by yeah. the way. Yeah, absolutely. Governor Weld. <laughs> One second. Yeah. So all three mayors were brilliant. I'm Bill Weld, former governor. Uh, former Governor Dukakis and I are both board members of Boston Harbor now. And some of you may know that uh, uh, we feel that because there's uh, no uh, rail link between North Station and South Station, it's difficult to live south of town and work north of town and vice versa. And let me tell you that that has a huge negative impact on regional economic uh, competitiveness. And it seems to me that if we do what we're all talking about here and vastly expand the amount of water transportation both uh, from north and south into Boston, but also perhaps from north uh, to south and vice versa, that could scratch that itch. So that's a huge economic issue. It's one that Governor Dukakis and I have gone up and spoken to Governor Baker about, and he said, I'll bite, and I, I, I hope that mind is going to remain open. But this is um, at the top of, uh, top of my list. Uh, I lived on the waterfront when no one knew the harbor was there. When John Barrows ran for mayor, Mayor Walsh, I think he said he didn't really see the harbor until he was something like 12 or 15 years old. Uh, and, uh, you know, I got to do the suit to clean up Boston Harbor in the 80s and uh, the big dig to take down the artery in, in the 90s. So anything I can do here with Governor Baker, otherwise I'm there with bells on, no charge. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, sir. Other questions right here. <clears throat> First of all, thank you very much for coming and giving us this much information. I am worried about love's labor lost. I would like you to step back for a moment and think about the entire metropolitan uh, Boston estuary being vulnerable to sea level rise, not just 20 or 30 years, but 50 or 100 years out. The entire area could be protected, and that includes all three of the communities that are represented by the mayors right now, by a 14-mile-long barrier between Swampscott and Cohasset. It's, some, it's an idea that, that has gathered 400, um, 400 signatures to be studied as a real uh, alternative to the uh, individual small protective measures, which perhaps will help for a short time, but they will not 
avoid the calamity that is facing all of us and we really do need to think that far ahead so that we don't waste the intermediate steps that are being undertaken right now. Wonderful ideas, they are, uh, they are very productive, but they need to go and be su uh, supported by the big picture and the long-range plan. So I'll paraphrase this for the audience and give you all another chance to a minute to think about it. And I, I think Peter's question is, you know, should we be looking to some really ambitious uh, harbor-wide barrier stretching from where to where? Squamset to Cohasset, uh, 14 miles. And um, I am very familiar that there, with the barrier study that's underway by UMass Boston uh, that's going to be coming out next week. Yeah. But does anybody want to comment on this no, question? I was just trying to get my, my cheat yeah. sheets from Austin. And, and um, um, it's something that the report for Boston Harbor will be coming out next week from UMass. Uh, and we're looking forward to seeing what, what that is. I, you know, I, again, I, I don't know enough about it to be able to say uh, it, it would work or it wouldn't work. I think some of the concerns that people would have would be the, the depth of the ocean and how does it work that way and, and, and certainly uh, the cost uh, of it, who would, who would bear the brunt of the cost. I mean, um, I know the federal government doesn't have that. I mean, the, the state government doesn't have that type of money uh, to, to make that type of investment. I mean, I'll speak for the state in this one because we're both former legislators. Uh, I, I just think that uh, in lieu of that, we look at it, but I, I, think, I still think we have to be creative in how we look at other ways of, of, of protections for our harbor. And I know you're talking about the, the, the life out in the harbor. It's a in a little different situation there. Um, yeah, just to follow up, Mayor Walsh, I, I think the studies that the city has done in partnership with the Green Ribbon Commission and others, Seaport, East Boston, Charlestown, has at least given me a lot of confidence that there's a lot we can do along the inner harbor. You know, at least a sort of three to five feet of sea level rise that we can provide a great deal of protection in, in, a, in a way that also will provide tremendous co-benefits to the communities around the city. So, I apologize. I have to run. Good. But if you want Austin Blackman, my chief environment's here. Good. Uh, he's probably... He's got a broken arm, though. He's not going to be as strong now. as you. So. I'm not going to tell you how it happened. Good. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Thank so. you. Okay. Other questions? Uh, full disclosure, I work for Boston Harbor now. My name is Alice Brown. But um, Mayor McGee, you described a future waterfront where there's retail and stuff that looks out over the water. And I think that's a, something you find as a, as a design feature in a lot of other cities, but you don't really find much of in the Boston area. Like even the Charles River is mostly roads and paths and parks on both sides. Do you have a model of some other city that you'd love to emulate? You know, there's, there's different places in Florida. I think San Francisco. There's other places that you know, we don't, I think, embrace being outside as much as we can in, in, in other areas. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it, you know it, it, it is something that I think other parts of the country have used. Baltimore has really taken advantage of, of their waterfront and creating like a really vibrant scene down on their waterfront. So I think it's, it, the piece is not just right on the water, but the open space part and, and having a place that, that really is great. I mean, I, you know, I, I say from, if you're looking, if you're going north from Boston, where, where are the really good locations to sit on the water and enjoy kind of being on the water? A mission on the Bay is up in Swampscott. Uh, I think what they've done in Gloucester at the Beauport Hotel is, is something where they really took advantage of a location that was a, um, you know, um, fish, refi uh, fish fact, you know, working with fish and, and put this beautiful uh, broad-based, um, you know, restaurant and, and, and area that you can really be outside on. So. I think it's uh, it's looking in other places, uh, probably more warmer climates, but I don't, I don't think that that's a reason that we can't do it around here. I'll just say on Linshaw Drive, which is our waterfront, doesn't matter what month of year, there's always all kinds of people out there, whether it's February, December, or July, that are out there enjoying being near the water, and I think we're losing those opportunities. So it's, uh, it's thinking a little outside the box and looking in other places that have taken advantage of that. Uh, whether it be in Florida, Miami, South Beach, or other places where they take advantage being near the beach. So um, those are the, some of the ideas. I'm Andrew Sharp. I'm from Authentic Caribbean Foundation from the region. So when you talk about tourism and the water, that's us. Um, is there going to be any collaboration or partnership since there is an act that has been established, which is the U.S. Engagement Act? in which we can partner as a region to look at how transportation, because you know the Grenadines and BVI strives on transportation, water transportation within. So that one aspect, if we can partner and look 
from birth, both perspective of mass and the region, what we have done well and what we have not done well to, to increase this economic growth here, because I would love to see more water taxi back and forth. So um, hopefully you will be considering that. Also in terms of climate change and the hurricanes, they ain't going away, they're getting bigger. Also we see they're moving north. So some kind of partnership in terms of studies, because now you know, it, it can affect us here also in Massachusetts, sea level rise and so forth. So I hope that is being considered in terms of strengthening that partnership with the region in terms of studies and so forth. So the question was, do we need to take a fact-finding trip to the Virgin Islands and Grenadine? In November? In November. I, I think more seriously, you know, maybe we should just ask sort of collaboration on issues like climate change and sea level rise. There's the Metro Mayor's Coalition here in Boston. What other ways are you all talking and working with each other on this very important issue? Well, I'll mm -hmm. speak to the water transportation piece. We've created the Water Transportation Advisory Council, which kind of started off with the water ferry uh, compact uh, under the past administration. And, and it's gotten, it, what it's been able to do is get uh, all of the players around the table, both the elected officials and others. I think that's really been, uh, you know, moving in the right direction because, it, uh, you know, in, initially when we were first talking about, at least in Lynn, uh, Lynn Water Ferry operation, it was Lynn, it was Salem. But I think we really understand more clearly and we're, when we're getting a chance to be on the table that collectively we're going to be successful in looking at it in a bigger way. And I think Boston Harbor Now's study was really keyed off of that collaboration uh, and as we continue to meet, we just had a meeting uh, last week. Uh, I think at, at least that's one example of, of what has worked or is starting to work uh, because, uh, you know, I think we realize that it can't be one community against the other, but regionally we really have the impact. And, and I think that recognition is coming as we continue to meet. It's not just our parochial interests of our community, but we really do, I think, have a chance, to, and we feel that. And, and Kim, you can speak to that. I think when we're around the table, we're thinking collectively, how can we a advance the agenda we believe in for the region and knowing that it will it'll benefit all of us. So that's, that's been something that I think has been successful, and we're lo I'm looking to see that, that grow and build. And it probably is a similar in, in a similar way, getting people around the table uh, on, on uh, resili resiliency and ch climate change and other issues that we are trying to address locally, but in reality we need to address regionally. No, I would just add to that, absolutely. I think the North Shore in particular, we value the ability f to get from one place to the other within our region. So there's definitely folks commuting into Boston, but there are people spending time crisscrossing where they live, where they work, where they go to school. And I think there's a real collegial, a sense of collegialism among the leaders within the North Shore. I want a strong Lynn. Lynn wants a strong Salem. We want Beverly to be successful. There's so much opportunity to build a network around where people want to go. There are many communities who aren't here tonight. Gloucester, Quincy, we could go on. Plymouth, P-Town, um, the Water Transportation um, Advisory Panel that, that Senator McGee led, uh, make, making sure it was created so we can think about doing it smartly. And the work of Boston Harbor now, the hope is they come together to really talk about this not as one-offs. I have a ferry, you have a ferry, Winthrop has a ferry, but a network, a real network of transportation alternatives that we can build off of, that we can have data, we can collect, that we can market and look at as it a real means of transportation. And I would just add to that, uh, not to interrupt, sorry, Kim, is, uh, uh, you know, there's a number of people that have identified as part of that advisory council. But I think it's important that, obviously, everyone in this room cares about this, that, that it, when it was created, it was, you know, here's the members now, but it really is not a, an ex uh, exclusive. It's a very inclusive. So it's important that either other communities or other leaders or other advocates that care about this will be a part of that ongoing discussion so, so that we can, again, in a bigger way, start to have those discussions, bring more people to the table so that we understand that these kind of investments or the, these kind of proposals that enhance our ability to create uh, many of the things we're talking about tonight can be done in a collective way. The more voices at the table, the more opportunity I think we find uh, uh, in the future. And just one last component. So my mom is a native of Trinidad, and I would say, yep, the welcome. fact-finding right? trip, yeah, excellent. Definitely, yeah. I second that, during yeah. Carnival, preferably. Yeah. Um, but it's a necessity on the islands, right? That's just how you get from one place. We don't have that same sense of urgency, but honestly, we're getting there. Anyone who is driving in a car, like I, I work and live in the same community. I feel blessed, because the times I do have to come into Boston, whatever time of day it is, it's 
unbelievable. It's no quality of life. And that is beginning to impact economics. And that's going to impact housing. We have to find some alternatives. And the water is staring us in the face. And if we think of it as a have to, we'll figure it out a heck of a lot easier. You know, I, I'm joking a bit about the fact-finding trips, but it's really important and really a good thing to do to go look at other cities. Uh, the, the Green Ribbon Commission that I'm on took a, a group of public officials from Boston to Copenhagen and Amsterdam two years ago to look at how they plan their cities and how they move about town. Amsterdam's climate is almost the same as Boston. It's pretty harsh on the North Sea. 45% of the people commute by bicycle every day of the year. So the question, how do you make a ferry work in the wintertime, is kind of moot, you know. Uh, so one last question, and then we'll uh, wrap up. Hi, going back, my name is Megan. Uh, going back to the recreational boating and bringing more kind of tourism in that way, there's nowhere to dock privately, or well, everything is private, but has there been any conversation about having either, pu um, sorry, public or metered docking lots or, or any slips like that any mooring throughout the, the city itself? Because you can't just dock and then go grab a bite to eat and then jump back in without a private slip and a very expensive membership. Definitely identifying what we call safe anchorage, so for, for transient moorings and trying to identify transient slips. In some ways, some of the permitting can work against that. Some of the areas where you have DPAs, they don't allow necessarily the recreational boating uses. So it's trying to flip that a little and find those areas. And with the water transportation, we also have bike sharing once folks get there. So we want to also have our little intra-city network. There'll be more this season. We hope to build off of that as we look at additional dredging and opportunities to find places for um, the boating community to come. Because we do value it as a real op relationship builder, as a, as a place that attracts millions of tourists a year, this is one component where we see there's a lot of area for growth. And it's, it, it's not really, Lynn is not at that point, uh, as Salem is, but I think one of the big, we haven't really talked about it, but where do the ferries go, where are the locations, where are the WAF locations, where is the uh, pleasure craft opportunities, where is the connection uh, where the restaurants are popping up right on the water, as the question was asked, so how do people get to those, bring their boats in and get to those spots, so that's, uh, I think, part of the larger planning, not only in our communities, but I think in the region, Boston in particular, how do we get those opportunities uh, and make those connections? And th those investments are a key piece of, of the whole plan as well. Okay, and it's, it's a great question. Uh, I know in Boston Harbor here, I think the only place where you can really do that is Liberty Wharf, where there are, you know, three or four restaurants, uh, but it's a big need to have more sorts of places where we can, people can, can arrive by boat and have a good time and then take off. So, um, I think we're going to end up on, uh, wrap up on that note. I'm going to turn it over to Kathy. Uh, if you want to learn more about these issues, uh, there's, a, there's another event coming up organized by Boston Harbor now next week. I want to thank our mayors for joining us. It was a really very uh, productive and useful conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you.